following subject matter is real and only intended for mature audiences. Discretion is advised. People are dead after deputies say a man went on a shooting rampage. I knew a week before she died I was going to kill her. I can tell you the scene out there is absolutely horrific. Nobody knows where this individual may strike next. This is 10 Minute Murder. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host, and listen, you know I love you, but I need to address something right out of the gate here. I've eaten so much candy today that I might pass out or run a marathon, either one. I'm so hopped up on Wildberry Skittles right now that I might finish this episode in nine minutes instead of 10. Probably not, but maybe. Also unrelated, but I ate all of the candy that I bought for the trick-or-treaters and it's not even October yet. Do they mail me an award for that or do I have to go down to the office and pick that up? Let me know in the, in the comments, please. BTW, if you're new to 10 Minute Murder, I hope that you'll subscribe if you decide that you're into brief stories about true crime, wherever you listen or watch. And there, there should be a button that says subscribe, follow, collect, or something like that. Just hit that button and you won't miss any future episodes of 10 Minute Murder. The story today is super famous and it's one that you've more than likely heard at least the name of. There have been countless books and movies made about the case, but as those so often do, they make up some of the details in order to make the movie or book more interesting. Well, today, I'm not going to make any of it up. I'm not going to sugarcoat the details. It's a gruesome and strange story. This is The Black Dahlia. On the morning of January 15th, 1947, Betty Bursinger was walking down the sidewalk in the neighborhood of Leimert Park, Los Angeles, with her three-year-old daughter, Anne, in a Taylor Tot stroller. The two were heading to a shoe repair shop when something caught Betty's eye on a vacant lot on Norton Avenue. She was not sure at first what she was looking at, maybe a Taylor's mannequin. The figure lying on the grass was extremely white in color, and separated in the middle, not looking like anything else other than an artificial model. But then Betty noticed the dark hair. When she took a closer look, she realized what she had actually found was a mutilated corpse of a young woman. Betty quickly ran to a nearby house where she called the police. The never-ending story of the Black Dahlia had started. When authorities arrived at the scene, the extent of the injuries on the naked body shocked everybody. The young woman had not just been cut in half, but her intestines had been removed. Her blood had been drained, and her mouth had been slashed from ear to ear, giving her the so-called Glasgow smile. Just as strange, the body had clearly been washed clean before being dumped in an empty field in a carefully set pose. Since there was no blood present at the crime scene, police concluded that obviously the young woman had been murdered somewhere else. But the first question on everybody's mind before anything else was, who was this dead and dismembered woman? Naturally, the LAPD fingerprinted the body, which was then sent to the FBI via sound photo, a device similar to fax, but typically used at that time for news photographs. Luckily, a match was found on the files in just one hour. The victim was identified as 22-year-old Elizabeth Short, who had been arrested in Santa Barbara, California a few years earlier for underage drinking. Once the victim's name was found out, the newspaper reporters immediately began to look for any crumb of a detail they could find about Elizabeth. They even called Elizabeth's mother Phoebe Short, pretending that her daughter had won a beauty contest in Southern California. One man present at the time, columnist Jim Sutton, later said, quote, I sat there, listened to the poor, dear mother telling him all about her school day triumphs. After pumping out all the details, Reporters finally revealed Elizabeth had actually been brutally murdered. I wish I could say that these types of soulless tactics were way in the past, but I'm pretty sure they've only gotten worse today. There are a handful of tactless and tasteless journalists that give the rest of them a bad name. At first, Phoebe didn't want to believe the horrifying news, but before long, police officers showed up at her front door. Every reporter painted their own story about who Elizabeth was. Some claimed that she had come to Hollywood from the East to become an actress. Some said she was a hooker. Others called her a war widow. 
During the years, her story has been told so many times in so many different ways, it can be difficult to tell what the factual truth even was. And many of the false claims actually came from Elizabeth herself. Elizabeth Short was born on July 29, 1924 in Boston, Massachusetts. She was the third of five daughters born to Cleo and Phoebe May Short. Cleo left his family when Elizabeth was just six years old, but not in the way that you would think. In 1930, Cleo's car was found abandoned on the Charleston Bridge, and it was assumed that he'd killed himself by jumping into the river. It was during the time of the Great Depression, after all. As a result, Phoebe was forced to move to a small apartment with her five daughters and work as a bookkeeper to support the family. Then, in 1942, Phoebe suddenly received a letter from her presumed dead husband, who was very much alive and had been living a new life in California. Cleo apologized and wanted to come back home. However, as you can guess, after being MIA for 12 years, Phoebe refused to see him again. Elizabeth grew up to be a beautiful girl, often described as more mature than her actual age. She suffered from asthma and lung problems, and even underwent lung surgery when she was 15, but was still seen as lively and energetic. Despite her mother's refusal to let Cleo come back home, and the fact that the last time she had seen her father was when she was just six years old, Elizabeth moved to live with him in Vallejo, California in December 1942. However, arguments between the two quickly escalated, and Elizabeth was forced to leave just after one month. She eventually moved to Santa Barbara, where she was arrested on September 23, 1943. The juvenile authorities sent her back to Massachusetts, but Elizabeth had other plans. She instead moved to Florida, where she met Major Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., a decorated Army Air Force officer. According to Elizabeth, the two quickly began a relationship, and after a while, Matthew proposed marriage. However, the two never got to say their vows because he died in a plane crash before that could happen. Elizabeth spiraled into a deep depression and drifted around the country until she relocated to Los Angeles in July 1946. Many stories say Elizabeth moved to L.A. to become an actress. But the truth is, she came after a man, another pilot named Joseph Gordon Ficklin. However, their romance didn't last. For the next few months, Elizabeth crashed at the apartments of acquaintances, telling different sob stories in hopes of getting money. After her death, the media portrayed her as a promiscuous woman sleeping her way across Hollywood. The truth is, she was just a lost soul, depressed after the loss of her fiancé. She told her mother and friends that she was pursuing an acting career. Yet, she never took an acting class or showed interest in the field. She also said she was working as a waitress, yet she never actually held a job in Los Angeles. Elizabeth's life spiraled out of control. At this point, one could have said that things could only get better. But that was not the case. On January 9, 1947, Elizabeth was dropped off at the Biltmore Hotel by Robert Manley. His nickname was Red, and he was a married man who she had been dating. Elizabeth was supposed to meet her sister, and she was reportedly seen by the hotel staff using the lobby telephone. After that, to this day, nobody knows what happened. The next time Elizabeth was seen was on that vacant lot on Norton Avenue, where she was found dead and in pieces. Elizabeth had been missing for six days before her body was found, and due to rope marks on her wrists, ankles, and neck, investigators believed that she had been tied down and tortured during that time. The autopsy revealed multiple lacerations to the head and face, and over her private area, a crisscross pattern. Based on precise cuts, it was thought that her killer might have been a surgeon, a doctor, or someone with medical knowledge. Elizabeth's cause of death was officially ruled, quote, hemorrhage and shock. The brutal murder quickly became heavily covered by the media, and Elizabeth was given the moniker Black Dahlia. For two months, the case was front page news in all the local papers every day. Soon the investigation was swamped with anonymous tips and reports. Some of them proved to be useful, some not. Several false murder confessions frustrated the LAPD, which I still don't understand why people do that. A combination of unreliable witnesses and a lack of hard evidence significantly slowed down the progress in the case until it eventually ran into a stone wall. Still, after more than 70 years, we do not have clear answers to what happened to Black Dahlia. Several suspects have remained under discussion for the years, including physician George Hill Hodel Jr., 
whose own son, Los Angeles homicide detective Steve Hodel, accused his father of killing Elizabeth. After his father's death, Steve uncovered photos of a woman who resembles Elizabeth in George's personal photo album. Steve also had a handwriting expert compare his father's writings to letters sent to the press shortly after Elizabeth's death by the alleged killer. The handwriting seemed similar, but the results were not conclusive. And by the way, I could do a whole episode on George Hodel because he was creepy AF and also a suspect in the Zodiac murders, by the way. Even more aggravating, the evidence was that of a recorded conversation with George and an unidentified visitor. In this recording that was collected by police in 1947, after a wiretapping at George's house, you can hear him saying, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. He's suspected of, by the way, forcing that secretary to overdose in order to cover up a mountain of criminal activity, including the fact that he performed illegal abortions as favors to law enforcement and politicians. Even after all of that, the Black Dahlia case still hasn't been officially closed. The fact is, George is now dead, and so are most of the hundreds of suspects in the case, making finding out the truth even more difficult. And so, Elizabeth's story is still waiting for its ending. There's not yet been justice for the victim, the family has never gotten closure, and the killer is still unknown. So you would say it's apt that the drink, named after the young woman, the Black Dahlia cocktail, that is still found on the menu at the gallery bar of the Biltmore Hotel, tastes bitter. That's today's 10-minute murder, brief and bingeable true crime. Thanks for listening today, and I hope my sugar rush didn't force me to speed through the details too quickly. If you've come this far and you like what you hear, I hope that you'll consider subscribing to 10 Minute Murder. Also, connect with me on Facebook and Instagram. I post visuals that go along with the episodes there. It's nothing gross or graphic, but I find that it's more interesting to put faces and names and actually see the places that we're talking about. I'll leave the links to follow in the show notes of this episode. Or just as easily, you can go to Facebook or Instagram and search 10 Minute Murder, and it'll pop right up. I really appreciate you listening. Have a good night.